thanks as well to, uh, to Jerry Mannion of the Carnegie Corporation of New York for supporting this work, and to our great authors and speakers and um, moderators, and to all of you for being here. This is uh, actually an event where we hope that not everybody that registered comes to it, because <laughs> we, uh, we cut off registration at about 180, and this room fits about 100. And there's overflow downstairs, but we are probably going to be fairly packed today. And, I, and then finally, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Father Lydia Tomasi, who's sitting in the third row to, to my left there, who's the, uh, who's the founder of the Center for Migration Studies. He founded the Center for Migration Studies and founded mm -hmm. the International Migration Review 50 years ago this year. So it's great to have him here. and He's working with us on the 50th anniversary celebration as we speak. So it's great to have you, Father. Um, so today what we're going to be doing is providing a, a very extensive overview of the U.S. refugee protection system, which we define very broadly to include refugee programs, asylum programs, and temporary protection programs. We're going to be identifying deficits in protection um, and ideas to create a more robust system, and we're going to be placing all of these challenges in, in an international law, in a broader international context. More than a decade, more than a Decade. More than a year ago, we convened a group of experts, of NGOs, academics, former government officials, and others to kind of talk about refugee protection needs. And we wanted to look at the refugee system as a whole because these individual programs don't um, don't hold up as standalone programs. They're meant to be. They're meant to be a whole. They're meant to be a system. And we were also worried that the system as a whole was fraying, and that's something that I'm still wor worried about and that protection imperatives hadn't kept pace with national security developments and, and um, fraud concerns and, and enforcement developments as well. So we wanted to build on the good ideas and legislation like the Refugee Protection Act of 2011 and now 2013, S-744, which is the Senate um, Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill, and on the work of our authors and speakers at this event. And in this process, I should say, we've been particularly cognizant of the need to ensure the safety, the security, and the integrity of the refugee system overall, which we think is crucial to gaining wide support for these programs, which is what they deserve. So for us, this event is the culmination of about a, a year, a year and a half process of engagement with these experts, and it's the beginning of what we hope will be a long-term commitment on refugee protection by the Center for Migration Studies. We're a think tank, so our work involves scholarship and the promotion of good ideas and events and the normal types of think tank work. However, I should also say that we hope to begin ourselves with our partner agency, the um, Scalabrini International Migration Network, to start collecting data in a systematic way from welcoming centers and migrant shelters from around the world, and they have about 270 of those. So that's a project that we're very much involved in and interested in right now. If you haven't already signed up for our journal on migration and human security, which is where the articles from this event and this process are going to be published and are being published, please do so. We encourage you to do so. Brianna George is the managing editor. She's in front here and can speak to that. And we'd also encourage you to attend our large event on legalization on September 29th and the rollout event for our special 50th anniversary edition of the International Migration Review which will be all day on September 30th. And our 50th gala dinner will follow that event on September 30th, and that'll be in Battery Park. The, the progression today, let me go through it very quickly. Mark von Sternberg of Catholic Charities of New York, who's a, who's a longtime esteemed colleague and mentor of mine, with numerous other affiliations, I should say, as well. Um, we'll start by analyzing U.S. protection challenges in light of international law, and then we'll ask Sanjul, Weir, Sanjul Weir, Weir Singh from Georgetown University's Institute for the Study of International Migration to speak on migrants in crisis. That's a category of migrants in need of protection that's actually gotten quite a bit of traction in the context of the UN-focused migration and development dialogue and other processes in recent years. And we're also very privileged and grateful to have Shelley Pitterman um, from the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees on our first panel. And he's going to place U.S. protection issues 
uh, in the context of other states' practices and the protection challenges generally facing the international community. We'll then begin to address the U.S. protection system more directly uh, with a panel moderated by Megan McKenna of Kids in Need of Defense, and that panel is going to cover the ability of those at risk to access territorial protection. It's, it's not protection if you can't get there. And the particular challenges we're seeing with Mexican asylum seekers on the U.S.-Mexico border, the raging crisis of unaccompanied minors, which is really a human security crisis that first and foremost affects those, those children, 60,000 of them projected to come this year, um, but also their communities of origin and the United States. We'll then break for lunch. Some of our panelists will participate in a call over lunch, I think, on, on, um, on unaccompanied minors. And uh, we'll begin the afternoon promptly at 1.30 with a panel moderated by Linda Hartke of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services on the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program and on Temporary Protection Programs. And this panel will be followed by a short break and then a panel moderated by Karen Grise of the law firm of Fried Frank on the U.S. political asylum system, which will cover recent developments in asylum law, protection of the stateless, internal barriers to protection and due process issues. And we'll end the day with a session moderated by Eleanor Acer of the Human Rights First that highlights policy and legislative ideas, opportunities, and challenges. That panel is going to lift up some of the issues and ideas that have gained traction in Congress and elsewhere. We're very, very gratified today to have attracted the expertise uh, um, that will be speaking, but also all of you in this room. It's, a, it's just a terrific crowd. Um, since we have limited time, we're going to not do long introductions. We're going to spare you those. But you can read about our moderators and their accomplishments and our speakers and the materials. Given that we have many experts in the audience, we're asking our speakers to, to be relatively brief so that we have enough time for dialogue with you. Um, with that in mind, and it's not directed at you, Mark, but with that in mind, <laughs> to, my, to my friend and my longtime esteemed colleague, Mark von Sternberg, to start our day. John, thank you so much. Uh, let me begin by saying that it's a pleasure and an honor to be invited to speak here at CMS. I'd like to express my gratitude uh, to the center and to Don for inviting me. Um, my topic is really rather broad, and I'm going to be talking about two fundamental issues. Uh, the first of those is access to asylum procedures in general. And the second is, what is the scope of protected interests? Is there any normative value, for want of a better term, which holds the diverse types of refugee protection available at the state level together? So basically, procedure on the one hand and substantive criteria on the other. With regard to access to asylum procedures, regrettably, any discussion of this topic must begin with highly inflammatory and controversial Supreme Court decision, uh, the Supreme Court being that of the United States, in SAP against Haitian uh, Refugee Council. In that case, the Supreme Court ruled that the norm of non reformal, Article 33 of the 1951 Convention, did not extend to the high seas, uh, permitting uh, the Coast Guard to go ahead and interdict Haitian vessels and to return Haitian nationals who were attempting to come to the United States uh, to be returned without a hearing, any kind of a hearing or an interview with regard to their claims to refugee status. Uh, this case, when it was decided, was largely considered to be uh, anathema. Uh, Guy Goodwin Gill, writing the pages of the International Journal of Refugee Law, said, the one thing the Supreme Court achieved in its decision was to add itself to the list of violators. Uh, and that pretty much remains characteristic of international scholarship about the case. It was devastating. The court went into the travaux preparatoire of the 1951 convention. It said that generally it could not find any desire uh, on the part of the framers to reach this situation where individuals were on the high seas 
It uh, concluded, of course, uh, Stevens' majority opinion, Justice Stevens' majority opinion, that once you access the territory of the sovereign state, you can claim protection. But until you got to that point, you were on your own. It was a system of laissez-faire, laissez-passe. The effect of what the court did was to protect, uh, produce a legal black hole uh, for refugees in which there was no law and consequently there were no rights. It's interesting to me, looking back on this case in the context of the superseding Guantanamo cases, that this was a mistake the Supreme Court did not make again when it was called upon to decide the extent of the writ with regard to uh, Guantanamo individuals seeking protection in district courts. So, in any event, uh, we start with that decision, and then we come down to the general, uh, the universal rejection of the decision. The uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights uh, denied that uh, such a decision was compatible with other international instruments, including the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights, uh, and the right guaranteed in that instrument to seek and, and enjoy asylum, uh, similarly, I think, and by the time we come to the Hersey decision, the European Court of Human Rights also uh, rejected broadly the, uh, uh, the decision in sale. Uh, Hersey was a case arising under Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, but still dealing with a related norm of international protection. And in Hersey, uh, the European Court of Human Rights pretty much ruled that it doesn't matter where you are. The niceties of jurisdiction do not determine the scope of procedural protection. Rather, protection follows the use of force per se. So if a state enters into uh, international waters, interdicts individuals, sends them back to their home state, it is as effectively involved as though it rejected them at their own frontiers. And remember, for years, UNHCR from its inception had taken the position that rejection of the frontier was a form of non reform law. Uh, basically, again, I have to say, with regard to the Hersey case, that it really catches up with that editorial by Guy Goodwin Gill in the pages of the International Journal of Refugee Law. Uh, basically, uh, Guy Goodwin Gill had advocated the idea that it was force rather than territorial jurisdiction uh, that determined who was entitled to protection, and that idea is received a broad endorsement in Hersey. So international law is going in precisely the opposite direction from that in, uh, uh, set out in the sale decision. One other area that I would like to talk about is interdiction through pre-screening. And here uh, I would cite you to the Prague Airport case in which uh, British agents were assigned to the Prague Airport. Their idea was to stop Roma uh, ethnics from getting on planes heading to Great Britain where they have to <coughs> seek asylum. Uh, generally, this arrangement was struck down, but not on the ground that it violated the 1951 Convention. Uh, it was struck down on equal protection grounds because it was just Roma who were being singled out and not anybody else. Roma, uh, essentially, the interdiction of these Roma was considered allowable under the Refugee Convention. Why? Because they had not crossed an international frontier and therefore could not meet the threshold definition of refugee. So we have a series of cases now dealing with interdiction at sea and through pre-screening mechanisms. And again, all of them are turning out from the refugee's point of view and with the exception of sales successfully. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to leave the area of uh, interdiction and I'd like to talk about the next bar procedurally to uh, asylum seekers, and that is safe third country agreements. Uh, I guess the matrix for <coughs> these agreements is really the Schengen and Dublin Accords in Europe. Uh, I, I would imagine most of you are familiar with these. Essentially, they require that asylum seekers seek protection in the country of first presence. And if that isn't done, uh, the individual can be repatriated to the country of first presence and there to uh, seek his, to develop his claim. This, uh, this arrangement had a number of notable holes in it. It created the refugee in orbit syndrome, uh, which haunts it still, uh, despite amendments that were made to the uh, arrangement in 2003. There is no real mechanism 
effective mechanism, I should say, nor a decision maker who can decide what the country of first presence actually is. So the refugee market <coughs> remains a problem. The Canada-U.S. safe third country agreement is the arrangement in the United States. Uh, this is the one safe third country agreement that we actually have. Uh, query, is it working? A recent study by the Harvard uh, uh, Refugee and Asylum Law Clinic uh, put out a report quite recently, several months ago, suggesting that it really is not working, <coughs> that basically it promotes rather than suppresses smuggling, and of course the suppression of smuggling is one of the chief objectives that it was put into, uh, put into place to deter. Uh, again, uh, a real problem, but what I would suggest to you about safe third country agreements is that they really offend the basic international law concept that the individual refugee should really have his choice with regard to where to file. That this may be forum shopping, but it makes sense if you realize that there are diverse jurisdictions out there. Some of them look favorably on some types of claims, some do not. Canada, for example, has looked favorably on gender-based cases for years. It has looked favorably on cases uh, based on induction into an army, which was itself violating the laws of war. And quite recently, it has looked favorably on gang cases. Uh, not through the refugee definition so much, but through a, the consolidated protected grounds existing in the IRPA statute, the Immigration Reform and Protection Act. So Canada is, in fact, affording some relief to victims of gang violence. And I guess of all of you know who read the papers, uh, the Board of Immigration Appeals has just come down on, uh, on gang cases rather hard in two leading cases, MEVD and WGR, which takes me to the last aspect of procedural uh, concerns. What about uh, expedited removal and the issues involving detention. Uh, here I would say that uh, the Department of Homeland Security has evolved to a considerable degree. Uh, now it will consider individuals who pass credible fear whose identity can be established eligible for release through the, through the parole program. And it has been paroling some aliens out of detention. Uh, it is not working fast enough, however, according to Human Rights First, which has written a succession of reports on the topic. And, uh, and so it, it could speed up its procedures. But other than that, it seems to be moving uh, in the right direction. What about the MEVD and WGR cases? They now have been worked into the lesson plan for asylum officers. So that when asylum officers go down to interview prospective uh, asylum seekers in detention to determine whether or not they have a credible fear of persecution, uh, those individuals will be taking into account MEVD and WGR. This is problematic from a number of viewpoints. First of all, it is problematic because uh, the MEVD case and WGR go directly at circumscribing social group. The social group ground of refugee protection has always been the ground which has been looked to by advocates and adjudicators to expand the refugee definition precisely because it is open-ended and because it is intended to take in new patterns of discrimination not foreseen by the framers in 1951 and further, a further evolution of international human rights law, the two uh, elements which provide the chief fodder, the chief uh, organizing principles for the development of the refugee definition. So this fact does not bode well for the development of asylum law in the United States. If you can really foreclose uh, the development of these cases in a truncated credible fear interview and say, well, you don't have an asylum claim, <coughs> who, and there is no record of this, there's no series of adjudicated cases or anything else, how is this going to help the development of the law? But it is, and it stands poised to significantly damage the development of the law. Now, uh, I'd like to turn quickly to uh, the substance of my presentation, uh, the, uh, is there a standard which holds the diverse kinds of refugee protection together? Uh, again, we have interpretations of the refugee definition in Europe, which differ from the refugee definition in the United States, uh, and those uh, conclusions differ from the refugee definition applied in Canada. Is there something which unites uh, these diverse bodies of jurisprudence, and what I would suggest to you is that it is the law of non-reformant. 
Not that that is necessarily consistent throughout, but it stands at least poised as an essential standard within which to draw all these different kinds of adjudications together. So, uh, with regard to what non reforma entails, uh, I would suggest to you uh, to read the very learned article by uh, Bethlehem and Lauderpack in a series of essays that appeared sponsored by the United Nations Convention for Refugees in 2003, which develops the law of non reforma. And essentially, there are several features to it. Uh, return to conditions of persecution is one standard uh, for non reforma. Return to conditions of torture or cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment is another standard. And of course, return to conditions where the alien will be exposed to the death penalty uh, is a third ground. The third ground has always been problematic with regard to the United States and its customary allies in this uh, endeavor because the United States allows the death penalty. The Canadians do not, and that itself has created a lot of concern with regard to implementation of the Canada-US safe third country agreement. Still, it's, it, it doesn't seem to be resoluble at this level. International law, again, is going against the idea that uh, the death penalty is permissible under prevailing standards of due process. Notwithstanding that, uh, it still is a source of contention. The chief issue, I suspect, with regard to non reforma is whether or not protection against conditions of upheaval exists. Uh, there is general consensus that uh, an individualized fear of torture or of persecution will support a claim of non reforma. But what about individuals who are being returned to conditions of generalized violence? Uh, several regional instruments provide protection in this context, and I think practically all of you know what the leading ones are. The OAU Convention, the Organization on African Unity is one. Uh, the Cartagena Declaration is another. Again, you don't have to show an individualized fear of persecution, just that you'll be returned to civil war conditions. Um, in the United States, I would add here that there was a period in the late 80s in which uh, advocates in this field tried to persuade uh, the immigration courts and the Board of Immigration Appeals that there was such a thing as the right not to be returned to generalized conditions of violence. It was the right not to be returned to generalized conditions of violence. That was rejected in two important adjudications, matter of Medina at the board level and matter of Echeverria Hernandez within the Ninth Circuit. A very important and influential immigration judge decision, uh, Judge Nijelski writing, uh, disagreed with both these conclusions and entered a positive adjudication in a case called Matter of Santos. Why could Judge Nijelski enter such an adjudication? Because what, what the state of international customary law is, is a question of fact, not really a question of law, and it changes over time. And Judge Nijelski said there is sufficient evidence before me to make a ruling that uh, the international law prohibits return to generalized conditions of violence, and I'm going to rule. The case stayed on the books because uh, the appeal petered out when Salvadorans got the relief they were seeking through an independent statute. But it stands out there as a very, very interesting and persuasive uh, adjudication and one which advocates probably should be aware of. So what's happened in Europe? In Europe, at the same time, you have adjudicators <coughs> developing the customary norm of temporary refuge, an extremely important development in international law. Uh, this was done primarily with the Germans and other uh, European states to accommodate the flows that were coming out of Yugoslavia during the very, very brutal civil war of 1991-1994. These individuals were fleeing to Germany and other states. It wasn't time to enter into the individualized adjudication, which was required by the 1951 convention. There had to be some sort of blanket determination. And there was one, and the device used was temporary refuge a customary norm. What happened to customary, the customary norm of temporary refuge? Well, it was picked up in uh, the um, uh, qualifying directive, the qualification directive governing on the European Union, uh, Article 15C. Article 15C, regrettably, has some very ambiguous language in it. It protects against an individual fear 
of being returned to conditions of indiscriminate violence. You have on the one hand an individual fear, and then you have indiscriminate violence on the other side. How do you reconcile these two competing standards? And quite recently, the European Court of Justice succeeded in doing that uh, in a leading case called El Gafaji. And in El Gafaji, it essentially ruled that uh, the individual fear and the intensity of generalized violence are coefficients of one another. So the more intense the generalized violence is, the less the individual has to prove an individual fear of, of, of serious harm. Alternatively, the more the individualized fear is present, the less a showing has to be made on generalized violence. I think the formula is a good one, though I concede it's difficult to apply in practice. And the decision in El Gafaji has received a lot of scholarly opposition on the ground that the tribunal, the European Court of Justice, never goes so far as to elaborate and to spell out what, when that level of uh, intense internal violence is met. So is there? a norm of non reformant with regard to those who are afraid to return to civil war conditions without being able to spell out uh, an individualized fear of persecution. I would suggest that there is. Uh, if you follow the El Gafaji formula, if you accept these two competing norms, certainly if you're being returned to a state where there are systemic and widespread violations of the laws of war, by either side in the conflict. That would, I suggest to you, support a claim of non refoulement without having to meet the individualized uh, definition in the Refugee Convention. I'd like to... Good. Um, I'd like to say a word about temporary protected status, because I think that any discussion I have today would be incomplete without it. Temporary protected status is certainly a wonderful idea certainly advances the law significantly. I am troubled by a number of features of this, these provisions, however. The first is that it requires a designation for the law to become effective at all. And once you require a designation by the Department of Homeland Security, you really are entering into the realm of politics. Haiti went on for years without being designated, and it only became designated when it underwent that horrible earthquake, an illustration of an inherent limitation in the TPS statute. The other is that once designation is made, those arriving after the designation date do not receive protection automatically. It was Congress's wish not to open the door to invite a flood of people coming in, running from uh, generalized violence, natural calamity, whatever, anything that makes social life non-sustainable. Most of the flows will follow the calamity. They will not precede it. So in, a, in essence, by cutting off the flows at the outset, you really are ignoring, in my respectful submission, the bulk of the problem. What is needed is some sort of an adjudicative mechanism that will allow the officer involved, whether it is an immigration judge or whether it is an officer with the Department of Homeland Security to make an individual determination on whether or not an individual would be exposed to cruel and human and degrading treatment upon return. Uh, our conditions in the home state such that a, a, a social life is not sustainable and that this individual would be directly affected by it. But it must be an adjudicative, it must be by way of an order, as they used to say when I was in law school, uh, rather, than, in, uh, rather than by way of a rule. Uh, you can't just rely on a rule that sets apart some states and not others. You need an individual adjudication in which the interest to be served will be fully expressed and protected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for the invitation and the opportunity to be here and present to you today. My presentation isn't directly relevant to the asylum and refugee context, but I hope you find it interesting nonetheless. Um, for some time now, a whole host of actors have recognized that the mechanisms that are available to the international community to protect and assist forced migrants who are compelled to flee for reasons other than torture and persecution cannot adequately be accommodated. 
Um, and this realization has prompted a whole range of efforts to try and better understand the populations who are in need of protection, the legal and operational gaps, as well as responsibilities of different actors, be it in the context of disasters, impacts of climate change, situations of violence, or other circumstances. And a number of initiatives have come into existence in recent years to address apparent shortcomings. And one initiative is a working group that's been set up by the United States and the Philippines with the aim of improving the ability of states and other stakeholders to better protect migrants who are caught in situations of acute crisis. And that initiative essentially sets the stage for what I want to discuss with you today. I plan to highlight some protection implications for migrants who are caught in disasters as well as conflicts based on desk research that the institute I work for at Georgetown University has been undertaking and is still undertaking as part of a broader project on crisis migration and then give you a little bit more information about the state-led initiative. A point on terminology before I get started. I use the term migrant synonymously with non-citizen and non-national and use those terms interchangeably. And what I mean by migrant are people who are located in a country that's not their own. Um, people like refugees, asylum seekers, stateless populations, regular and irregular migrant workers, students and other populations. So first, a little bit about our crisis migration project. In late 2011, with generous support from the MacArthur Foundation, ISIM began a project to better understand the commonalities and movements and protection needs that are associated with humanitarian crises triggered by very diverse events and processes. We defined a humanitarian crisis as any situation in which there's a widespread threat to life, safety, health, or subsistence that's beyond the coping capacity of individuals and the communities in which they reside. And what this broad definition allowed us to do was examine a whole host of situations that are triggered by cyclones, tsunamis, floods, earthquakes, nuclear accidents, melting permafrost, drought, famine, conflict, violence, and even pandemics. So those that were naturally occurring as well as man-made, and those that evolved uh, quickly as well as those that evolved more gradually. Through commissioned research, including many case studies, we posited three principal ways in which movement occurs in the context of humanitarian crises. One, encompassing the compulsion to move. Another, encompassing anticipatory forms of movement. And the third, encompassing those who are trapped in place and facing impediments that inhibit them from moving out of harm's way and are therefore in need of some type of relocation assistance. These categories are not meant to be legal definitions by any means, but really just our attempt to describe the phenomena of movement. And they're not meant to be mutually exclusive either, that people can move from one to another. The commissioned research also showed that there were commonalities in protection needs. And one area of commonality related to the vulnerabilities and protection needs of certain categories of what we termed at-risk populations, one being non-citizens. And this has now prompted further research that's ongoing to better understand what vulnerabilities and protection needs are of non-citizens who are caught in crises. So on that, as you're probably all aware, over the last decade, the world's witnessed a number of natural disasters and conflicts, including the Asian tsunami in 2004, the conflict in Lebanon in 2006, the crisis in Libya in 2011, the triple disaster in Fukushima, 2011 floods in Thailand and Hurricane Sandy here, where migrants have been among those most seriously affected. And in situations like these, there's a tendency for the protection of migrants to fall between the cracks because existing frameworks insufficiently articulate the responsibilities of different actors and stakeholders. So in this respect, let me highlight five protection implications that we've been able to draw from our ongoing research and what these implications show is that responses are necessary at all phases of a humanitarian crisis, from vulnerabilities that may affect migrants before a crisis has even started, to specific needs during a crisis, and then to challenges that may reverberate after a crisis has passed. The first implication is that when non-citizens are caught in crises, they can be distinctly vulnerable due to a range of reasons. 
And these vulnerabilities can stem from, one, the underlying environment in the country in crisis. So you can imagine, for example, if employees are allowed to take away ID or travel documents, that trying to leave in the context of a crisis becomes hampered. Vulnerabilities can also stem from being a migrant, issues such as language barriers, lack of access to social capital and networks, and a lack of sense of empowerment and entitlement. And lastly, the crisis situation and actions of state and non-state actors can present vulnerabilities. So in the context of the floods in Thailand in 2011, there were reports of exploitation and extortion of migrants as they attempted to flee, flee across the Thai border to get to Burma or Cambodia even. Second, among non-citizens, different groups manifest unique protection needs because of their specific circumstances. So persons who are in irregular situations face obstacles in accessing protection and assistance because of their status, because of their fear of deportation, and also because both governments of countries of origin and destination often lack information about where they are and what their needs are. So during Sandy, for example, certain types of assistance was available to undocumented populations and immigrate enforce, immigration enforcement activities were called to be suspended. But there were reports that fear of deportation and other implications were factors that inhibited undocumented populations as well as those that were in mixed status families from accessing assistance. Lower skilled migrant workers who are residing in, residing in a regular status often face similar quandaries to those that are in an irregular situation because of restrictive or inflexible work permits, work in an unregulated environment, as well as lack of or limited assistance from their employers or countries of origin. In the case of Thailand, some low-skilled migrants' work permits were restricted to restricted their freedom of movement, and this was cited as one of the reasons why people decided to stay where they were, and, and so that they didn't jeopardise <coughs> their employment. Female domestic workers, because of their dispersal and isolation in the homes of employers, are also particularly vulnerable. In 2012, in Syria, as the conflict worsened, there were reports that Filipino and other migrant domestic workers were thwarted in their attempt to try and leave the country by their employers who refused to let them leave. And in Syria, for workers to leave, the government is required to provide an exit visa and employers need to also give permission and this didn't happen. Refugees and asylum seekers are then also particularly vulnerable because they cannot or they're unwilling or unable to return to their countries of origin so targeted responses are needed to protect them if they move in the context of crises. And stateless persons can face limited options and considerable ob obstacles to accessing protection because of their lack of connection to a particular state. And then lastly, those who may be in detention, non-citizens who may be in detention, need targeted action as well. Third, protection needs vary based on the locale of movement. Now this may be obvious, but what it suggests is that Responses again need to target the types of movements that occur and what our research has showed is that a whole range of movements occur Some people move internally within the country some move across international borders into neighboring countries and some move further afield This was the case in Libya where people moved to Tunisia and Egypt, but also tried to reach Europe Some may be some may actually try and return to their own country But only a minority actually benefit from evacuation assistance the majority have to find their own way home and the routes that they sometimes end up using, whether it's smugglers or sea routes, often, often, often lead to even further harm. And then lastly, some may be trapped and again in need of some type of assistance to get out of harm's way because of physical impediments, security impediments and other factors. Four, then, in these contexts, many fundamental human rights are implicated the right to non-discrimination being one. In the context of Thailand, there were reports that relief services were provided on a discriminatory basis. Um, the right to leave a country, as I explained about Syrian domestic workers. The prohibition on refoulement, as well as the right to seek and enjoy asylum, just to name a few, but many more fundamental rights are impacted. And fifth, to accommodate these protection needs, a coordinated multi-stakeholder response is needed. So countries of origin have a clear role towards assisting their nationals.
The Philippines has a lot of good practices in this respect. Countries where the crisis occurs has a role to provide non-discriminatory emergency services as well as access to consular and diplomatic protection. Neighbouring countries need to keep their borders open. Other states can provide aid, technical and logistical assistance as well as forms of temporary protection. Employers have a clear role and what our research showed was that many employers evacuated people who were in high level positions but often left those who were in lower level positions to their own devices. And then international organisations and civil society have roles particularly to fill in the gaps where other stakeholders have not picked up protection needs. And some of these international organisations such as IOM and UNHCR have particular mandates as well. So responding to these implications don't need to start from a clean state slate. There's evidence of many harm, many good practices as well as harmful practices that lessons can be learnt from. What's important is that during the pre-crisis phase, preparedness action targets both the underlying environment in the country experiencing a crisis, as well as the vulnerabilities specific to migrants, that during a crisis, timely, accurate, accessible and tailored communication regarding access to services as well as other protection initiatives is meted out. Um, and then lastly, even if migrants have moved out of harm's way, that there's a recognition that challenges may reverberate, such as livelihoods needs, protection needs, and reintegration challenges. So to finish up, let me just go back to the state-led initiative. Um, so as I said, the United States, together there with the Philippines, is leading a working group made up of Australia, Bangladesh, Costa Rica, Ethiopia, and the European Commission to improve the ability of states and other relevant stakeholders to prepare for, respond to, and alleviate the suffering and protect the dignity and rights of migrants caught in countries in situations of crisis. And the parameters of this initiative are that it's the country that needs to be in the crisis. It's not addressing migrants who are in situations of personal crisis. The acute crisis that they're looking at are conflicts and natural disasters. And migrants are defined broadly to include all non-citizens and non-nationals, including those in a regular and irregular status. Ultimately, the aim is to produce a set of voluntary guidelines and principles and best practices, laying out the roles and various levels of responsibility of states, so host, origin as well as neighbouring, international organisations and other stakeholders such as employers and civil society. And you can find more information about the initiative, including a concept note, a discussion draft, a schedule of consultation, as well as some frequently answered questions on that link that I've got up there. So finally, just to finish up, in terms of any protection framework, these are some of the fundamental principles that we think should be encompassed within a protection framework. There are many more, but just, just a handful, just to highlight some of the issues that need to be addressed. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for inviting, for inviting me. I'm the representative of UNHCR in the United States uh, and also cover the Caribbean. Uh, and my subject uh, starts with the concept of the global context. What is the global context? So many of you are reading the newspapers uh, and suffering the consequence, I think, every day. Um, we live in a world of multiple and complex, indeed very complex, and particularly violent emergencies these days. Uh, in Syria, in the Central African Republic, South Sudan, I won't uh, speak to the numbers because they change all too often, but we're 
we're in the we're in the millions uh, and protracted situations not protracted over weeks and months and years but now we're talking decades in Afghanistan and Somalia Colombia the Democratic Republic of the Congo and the global trends uh, for 2013 reflect that we've got the highest numbers of uh, people being newly displaced in 2013, 10.7 million persons, bringing the total to some 51.2 million people, including 16.7 million refugees, of whom 5 million are Palestine, uh, Palestinian refugees, 33.3 million IDPs, and 1.1 million asylum seekers. It's just too much, and the numbers are growing. 32,200 people leave their homes each day, are forced to leave their homes each day to seek protection somewhere else, either within or outside the country. That's a third higher than it was in 2012, and it's more than double the number of people fleeing daily in 2011. Uh, there may be as many as 10 million stateless persons around the world, but we've been able to count through our government uh, relations, three and a half million in 75 countries. The, 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 the extent of voluntary repatriation in 2013 was the fourth lowest in the last 25 years, only 414,600 people. There are more unaccompanied children than ever before. Half of all refugees are children. And we read regular media reports about deaths at sea, about border closures, about sexual violence, and we're confronted every day in trying to address these uh, unprecedented challenges with less money, uh, with challenges uh, of underfinancing and selective financing and late financing and conditioned financing. Uh, and this is not just UNHCR, but also our NGO partners and others who are working directly to help uh, refugees and IDPs. The global environment hasn't always been complicated, has always been, sorry, has always been complicated, but now it's even more so, as these trends suggest. And while this isn't an international relations symposium, it's clear that we're not living in the same bipolar or multipolar world. Something else is happening out there. And the nature and extent of U.S. power is changing and its influence in the world is also changing. But the U.S. is at the center of our attention in UNHCR from a protection point of view. The unprecedented levels of U.S. funding for UNHCR and other humanitarian efforts for refugees, IDPs, and stateless persons helps the protection response and mitigates, an even greater, uh, mitigates against an even greater nightmare. Um, there are four policy priorities for fiscal year 2015 for, for PRM in the State Department, a rapid and coordinated humanitarian response to address and try to resolve humanitarian crises, to promote and implement resettlement in the United States, and to give more attention to the protection challenges of women <coughs> and children. We find that these goals and objectives are, are laudable in the State Department. We'll have to see what the outcome is for the next fiscal year, but any reduction in funding for UNHCR and our partners would have a direct impact on protection delivery worldwide. So I introduce that notion because that is U.S. protection, maybe not strictly from the legal aspect and not in relation to domestic policy, but the U.S. is a key and very significant uh, contributor to, US, to, to protection worldwide. In the context of U, refugee protection, I think it's a fair assumption that what the U.S. does therefore matters. Setting the example can be an effective way for the U.S. to promote better practices, and it's a reference point for other states to improve their practices. On the other hand, U.S. practices that don't meet high standards can be used by other states to maintain their lower standards or to avoid improvements, essentially undermining the promotional efforts that the USA otherwise so generously contributes to. The US has always had considerable leverage in positively influencing programs and policies 
because of its generous engagement in refugee assistance at XCOM, uh, with the refugee coordinators who are present in the field and work very closely with UNHCR and with NGOs and others, its extensive direct contacts with UNHCR and partners, and in intergovernmental groups like the Intergovernmental Consultation on Migration, Asylum, and Refugees, and the Resettlement Working Group, uh, which is an intergovernmental group as well. I think it's, it's fair to say in some that it's used this influence positively in coordination with other key donors to, for example, build engagement for more protection of women and children, to expand resettlement opportunities, to coordinate emergency response, uh, and to generally improve protection awareness in humanitarian response. When it comes to resettlement as a protection mechanism, the U.S. record is very positive. The numbers are the highest, the historical commitment is steadfast, the political engagement is bipartisan and, and fairly reliable, and even though there's room for improvement, we know the experience with the terrorism related in admissibility grounds and the long delays and challenges with respect to integration and limited funding, it's clear that the U.S. is the engine that drives UNHCR resettlement globally. And even though, even though we're just able to resettle a fraction of the almost one million refugees that we consider to be in need of resettlement. We can't take resettlement for granted because there's a domestic impact. Uh, and for other key U.S. protection issues, it gets even more complicated. In just uh, the few minutes that I've got, I'd like to highlight three areas, which have already been mentioned in a way, where I'm concerned by the mixed signals set by U.S. policies and practices. For example, with respect to protection at sea, this is a particular, this is a subject of particular interest this year. The cumulative totals of deaths at sea have reached alarming levels. We read about it in the Mediterranean, in the Indian Ocean, in the Red Sea, for refugees going to Yemen, and also, of course, in the Caribbean. The High Commissioner will dedicate this year's dialogue on, inter on international protection to this issue. And it's 20 years since the Supreme Court ruling in Sale that validated the U.S. practice of interdiction. U.S. practices of search and rescue are indeed laudable. Lives are saved. However, the U.S. example is less sterling when it comes to ensuring that international protection standards are respected in the context of mixed migrations on the high seas. A mechanism is in place to screen Cubans who are in need of international protection, but only very few benefit from such a determination. <coughs> the U.S. government has introduced enhanced manifestation of fear triggers on the Coast Guard cutters to address the concern that others, in particular Haitians, in need of international protection were being returned by U.S. authorities without proper safeguards. And while the new procedures and training tools are welcome, and the identified manifestations are inclusive, only one Haitian of the 445 interdicted by the U.S. Coast Guard in fiscal year 2013 was given a credible fear interview, only one, and that person failed. Moreover, protection-sensitive mechanisms in the regional security arrangements is also a, a best practice. But UNHCR has no evidence that these mechanisms are monitored or enforced. And so we are concerned and have made it known to the relevant American and Caribbean authorities that individuals are being returned without protection screening or are being detained for prolonged periods. We hope that the dialogue uh, this year will, will advance the cause, and we've also been working uh, in a follow-up to a conference that was convened in May 2012 in the Bahamas uh, and in preparation for a, a ministerial meeting that will be convened in Brazil in December uh, on the 30th uh, anniversary of the Cartagena Declaration to advance the cause for some regional understandings toward uh, on dealing with mixed migrations in the Caribbean. In fact, just this week we have colleagues who are in the Bahamas doing training on asylum determination in the Bahamas. We also have another colleague, Leslie Velez, who many of you know, who's in Budapest dealing with uh, a review of UNHCR's global strategy on detention, which is the second issue I wanted to mention. Our advocacy to improve global standards 
will be hampered by the U.S. policy of mandatory attention, detention for asylum seekers. This is not a best practice for UNHCR, but we think it's unlikely to change. There are other gaps, notably with regard to legal protections for unaccompanied children, which we hope will be remedied. The reforms introduced to the U.S. immigration detention system over the last five years have had a positive impact on UNHCR's populations of concern, like reviewing the standards of immigration detention conditions, improved protections against sexual assault and abuse in detention, the introduction of risk of the risk classification assessment tool, pilot projects with NGOs for alternatives to detention, independent monitoring, and the special measures to address the best interests of children. <coughs> the last issue that I just wanted to highlight briefly is with, uh, focuses on access to procedures. The U.S. Has, has for several years had the largest number of asylum seekers. Only in 2013, Germany had took the number one position, due in large part to Syrian asylum seekers but there were still some 84,400 asylum claims registered in the U.S., reflecting an increase in the number of claims from Honduras and El Salvador. So while the USA sets an example in this regard and supports this uh, through active training by CIS officials and others to, in other countries, in other, for immigration officials in other countries, it's still regrettable that the current orientation with respect to persons, especially children, from Central America and Mexico who are likely to be in need of international protection is very restrictive. Part of the response is to focus on addressing the root causes of the movement. This is a constructive uh, engagement, but it will take time, doubtlessly. In the meanwhile, it appears that the business imperative is to stem the flow at the border by limiting access and by rejecting claims. This was highlighted by Mark in his earlier remarks, perhaps less explicitly. Um, one of the problems with this approach, apart from the obvious protection risks for the individuals concerned, is that it will make it harder for us to advocate for effectively more access to procedures and better adjudication in the countries to the south of the United States. So in my brief remarks, I've tried to demonstrate that the U.S. remains one of the most important defenders of refugee protection and that gaps in its own policies and practices risk setting unfortunate precedents for other countries. UNHCR remains very engaged to work with NGOs and with academia and directly with the U.S. government in order to safeguard the very good practices and to introduce necessary improvements that we hope will reassure and even inspire other countries to follow the U.S. example. Thank you very much. Okay, we have, you know, five minutes, ten minutes here for questions, comments. Do we have a mic? Right there. Okay, thank you. Sanjula, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. How do you, this issue of, um, getting states to kind of engage in the pre-crisis stage, you know, is, do, you, do you anticipate that that's going to be difficult to do, you know, to kind of anticipate and develop contingency plans prior to these, prior to these kinds of crises taking place? Obviously, I can't speak to the initiative at all, but yeah. I, I think that the Philippines has a lot of good practices in place already, uh -huh. um, and I think one of the plans with the initiative is to try and gather these good practices and have them in place so that then other states who are migrant sending countries like Bangladesh and many countries in Asia can then adopt them. Um, I'm not sure about funding, but what I know is that IOM has pilot program in place to try and implement some of the good practices that are already in place with, in Philippines, in other countries of origin of migrants. So. To answer your question, I think probably that's the easier part. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Tara. Good morning, Tara Magner with the MacArthur Foundation. Mark, you mentioned the lesson plans for asylum officers incorporating the new BIA decisions related to membership of a particular social group. 
Are you referring only, are, are the lesson plans only for the um, interviews for uh, in, when asylum seekers are first at the border, or are you also looking, are, are those lesson plans also applying to full adjudications? Well, they would apply necessarily to full adjudications. Mm -hmm. uh, the lesson plans are provide guidance for asylum officers, period, whether they are determining the merits of a claim in a non-adversarial setting by the asylum office, or whether they are conducting a credible fear interview. The main concern about having them added to the lesson plan really comes home in the credible fear interviews. Mm -hmm. When somebody is denied a claim in a full setting, and that's subject to review by an immigration court, later by the board, and later by uh, a review in court of appeals, there's a record on that and arguments can be made. When somebody is rejected at the credible fear stage, however, there is no such record. Mm -hmm. This claim simply stops right there. And the concern is that by preempting these claims at this stage, the future of the law will not have an opportunity to evolve. Mm -hmm. Once you get into the non-adversarial setting of the asylum office, and then into the EOIR, and then into the courts, it can evolve. But if you stop it at this level, it cannot. Right. I think that's an important distinction because much of what has been written about those lesson plans thus far has been in the context of credible fear interviews but not applied more broadly. So thank you for the clarification. Yes. Hi, I'm Sarah Pastino from Kids in the Age of Defense. Um, this question is about the safe third country agreements, so perhaps Representative Pitterman or Mr. Ben Sternberg could answer. Um, are there any distinctions in application, application of the U.S.-Canada agreement um, with respect to age, so for child migrants, for example, or is there any incorporation of the right to family unity um, in those agreements? So I have a client who's a 16-year-old Chadian former child soldier who tried to get to his sister in Canada and was returned to the U.S. There are certain relatives of children who will take them out of the system, who will take them out of credible fear. For example, a child who has a parent here who's a lawful permanent resident or a citizen, or who himself or herself may be an asylum seeker, that is enough to eliminate that child from the credible fear aspect of the Safe Third Country Agreement. I don't know that a sister would be a sufficiently close relative, uh, but I would have to examine the text of the agreement and, of course, the implementing regulations before I could give you a final view on that uh, on the question, the very interesting question that you're asking. But the whole thrust of the agreement, uh, or a large portion of it, has to do with exempting certain family relations from the credit, from the expedited removal category and allowing those folks to enter the United States to have their claims heard in a plenary setting. Okay, well, why don't we... Uh we're right on time then. We can ask the next panel to come up. And I want to thank this panel, which really did exactly what we wanted.